Isaiah 16 in the very first verse. The Bible says, See, send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be, for it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of, Ar of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Hide the outcasts, bewray not him that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab, be thou a, co a, co a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at, the, is at an end. The spoiler ceaseth. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us on a day-to-day -day basis. Lord, but now we need you to meet with us. Lord, we pray that you would uh, stir us up. Lord, give us comfort of heart. Let us stand in what you would have us to do this morning. Uh, we pray that you would uh, strengthen us, that you would guide us, and that you give us the words that you would have us to say. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to no notice a number of things concerning uh, our text. Uh, first of all, it begins, uh, Isaiah lived in a day of rebellion. Uh, Isaiah lived in a day where he kept warning and kept warning and kept warning, but there was no listening. There was no response to what he had to say. So in the first verse, he says, Send ye the lamb, the ruler of the land, from Selah to the wilderness, unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. So I want you to see that uh, he knew that uh, the lamb, need, they, what they needed was the lamb. What they needed was a uh, someone to give them a voice. And that's what uh, is needed most today is that we need a voice in the land which we live. We need a voice in the last times. And I've heard it said a time and time and time again concerning the end time. And no doubt there will be a great falling away. But we need a voice. They needed a voice. No one was listening. The nation was awry. No one was following the Lord. But what they needed was a voice. Uh, and, and we're not that as we should be today. I want you to see in verse 2, and the Bible says, And it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Now, I want you to see that when, when a bird is thrown from the nest for the first time, it doesn't fly that well. First of all, it has to be mature enough to, to be tossed out. And many times today, as we as the Lord's people, because of our neglect of the Word of God, when we get whooshed out, we're not ready. Now let me say this, if you're whooshed out, God must have a plan for you. If you're uh, boosted out of the nest, there's a reason that, that He would have you to be in that position. Now, when we see that little one boosted out, we are to be a help to them. And that's what he was saying to this, uh, this heathen nation, is you be a help to them. You be a comfort to them. You be the encourager. Uh, verse 3, he advised them, take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow on the night in the midst of the noonday, hide the outcast, bewray not him that wandereth. So he gives them a couple of good pieces of advice. And the first one is this. You give them a hideout. You give them a place to be preserved. You know what? Israel will always be preserved. Uh, our present administration has done everything in his power to set us awry against Israel. The worst thing any nation can do is set itself against Israel. 
And so we see that he gives them very sound advice. You be the hiding place. I remember when I was in college, we had to read a book called The Hiding Place. And uh, it was about a Jewish family that was hidden uh, during the Second World War. And ultimately, um, they, lost, they lost their fight. It was also called The Diary of Anne Frank. It, it was the exact same book. And, and it was... A story of a family doing what needed to be done. You know, and I dare say today, if we were under duress, I don't know that we would do the same thing. In verse 4, he says, Let mine outcast dwell with thee. Moab, be thou a convert to them from the face of the spoiler. Now, the spoiler, no doubt is the devil himself, or it's someone used as the devil. A spoiler, someone that ruins, something that causes decay. Now, we live in a time and day, just as Israel did to then, that the devil places spoilers in and among his churches. They would like to attack. They would like, and, and when the spoil gets in, it, it's not a sudden venom, venomous thing. It takes a while. You know what? There's a theory, and I really believe it, that every one of us has cancer on a day to day basis, and our body just takes care of it. And so, there, there, but when it gets the advantage, when it gets the nourishment it needs, and more, more often than not, under this theory, when your immunity doesn't work well against it, then it becomes an issue. And we need to be very cautious uh, that the spoiler uh, is not getting the advantage. So he warns them to be kind because the spoiler is out there. Let thine outcast, meaning Israel, dwell with thee. Moab, be thou a convert or a comfort to them from the face of the spoiler. It also says covert. When something's covert, it's hidden. You hide them. You keep them from the spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end. You know what a wonderful blessed thing it will be one day when the extortioner is at the end. Now another thing about an extortioner is someone extorts from a large company. You know first of all they have to be an employee of the company. They can't get access to the things they need to, ex to extort the money or the secrets or whatever the company possesses. They can't do that if they're not dwelling with them. So a covert can be among you as well. Someone that has all the signs and symptoms of a believer, but they're fake. And they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know Him at all. And so uh, Judas was such a character, was he not? And he, he, he did that. So what does an extortioner do to the church? No, he doesn't take money. I don't think. I've known a few people to do that. Uh, but he takes the life out of the church. He zaps it. That's an extortioner, a spiritual extortioner. And you know what? We have that even among us as individuals as we do anything else. I've often called them Debbie Downers. Uh, uh, Eeyore, y'all know I'm Winnie the Pooh. Eeyore comes in, oh, well, it's me. Don't you get sick of that in the last days? Everybody going boo hoo, boo hoo. You know what? We should be the happiest people that there are. Those individuals are extortioners and they're stealing your joy. That, that's what they do. That's their design. And the devil uses them explicitly. He likes to get people down to nothing. So the extortioners are within us. But he says there are times at an end. The spoiler, the one that comes in and rots everybody out, the Bible says he ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. So we have three groups. We have the spoilers, we have the extortioners, and we have the oppressors. Those are attacks against Israel, and they're attacks against the church today. 
Listen, uh, really we haven't seen an oppression yet, but you're going to see one. You know what? It all depends on which side of the fence you're on, so to speak. You know what? Numbers really don't bother me, but they're an oppressor to some. Oh, you know, well, we're down to four. Well, the Bible says we're two or three gathered together. In my name, there in the midst will I be. A lot of people have asked me, when do you think a church quits being a church? I don't know that it's possible as long as two or three are gathered. You know, all this stuff about electing offices in the church, there's not a word of Bible in that. Uh, it's good that we have people apt to teach. That's what the body, uh, the Bible says, that we have an individual that's apt to teach. But as far as being, uh, being you know, you don't need a treasure. You don't need a Sunday school teacher. All you need is people apt to teach. So everybody says, well, when you get down to this and this, it's no longer a church. I don't see Bible for it. I wish I did, but I don't. It's just not there. As long as two or three people are gathered together there in my name, there in my name, there in the midst will I be. That's a promise. And we should claim it. But we live in a day and age and we borrowed so many ideas from so many false religions that we really don't know what the Bible teaches. But I do know the attack does come this way. Look with me in the book of 2 Timothy. The first one we're going to deal with is the extortioner. Because he's very good at what he does. And he's here in the last day as strong as he's ever been. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in the 4th verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the 4th uh, verse. Uh, Paul gives young Timothy some, some information concerning the last time. Now, if you will notice, what, who was Timothy? He was a pastor, was he not? So where did this information have to deal with? It had to be in the church. Because listen, exterior to the church, listen, it's going to be lost people acting like lost people out there in the world because why? They're lost. It doesn't take a, a rocket scientist or a theologian to, to really come down to that, but within the church it becomes a problem. Now notice what it says, traitors. Now what is a traitor? A traitor is someone that sells you out. A traitor is, is an individual uh, that, that says they believe one thing and at the end they sell you out. In other words, someone that says they're for the cause of Christ and they come, they're a traitor. They go on the other side of the fence. That's a traitor. And he says in the last days there will be traitors, there will be individuals that switch to the other side that say, hey, this is no longer true. This, I was wrong. I'm for those people now. That's what I... Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, uh, Brother Junior got on that a little bit this morning. I believe the weaknesses of our churches today are really hinged on that loving the world, enjoying what the world has to offer, and the thrill that it gives to the flesh. Having a form of godliness, but denying their pow the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, how, it, how is it to deny the power? That's denying the power of God. Having a form of godliness, but then, you know what? Do you believe God is sovereign this morning? Every one of us say we do. Then why do we get so discouraged? You know what? If there's a problem this morning, if this building caves in, you know, when I put on uh, Facebook that time of that old store building in, uh, in Bumpus Mills that got blamed by the flood, Sister Diane thought it was a, build, a picture of this building. You know what? Uh, it wasn't the case. That, that, that was just a perception, right? And most of what we think of is nothing more than our perception of it. Right? It's it just how we look at it. And, and bless God, it wasn't was our little building here. 
but there was a perception. And I, I, could, I could see that after I posted and looked at it for a minute. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. How do we deny the power of God? In the way we live, the way we dress, the way that we act. Listen, uh, we are in the last times, and part of the last time is denying that God is able. You know what? Uh, I've heard people say, well, when the mark of the beast comes in, and I, I'm not sure exactly when that will happen, I do believe we'll have a form of currency before the mark of the beast that already exists. And the form of currency is that little chip right there. It's, it's already here. It, it has arrived. And when they want to put it here, are they going to say, or even before that, the government says, if you don't have that, you don't eat. You know what? It's going to get pretty tough, ain't it? Brother Ashley had five sons to feed. Pretty tough, ain't it? But our God, He can bring water from a rock, can He not? Our God has dominion over the fowls of the air. He can make them come down and feed us. So these individuals, you know, I've heard a lot of, and I've seen it preached concerning those great miracles of the provision of, of Israel. And everybody says, oh, that was just in the Old Testament. Why does it have to be that way? It does not have to be that way because our God changes not. He's never changed. He never will change. And if He wants water to come from a rock, you know what? Water will come from a rock because He's able. And, and so we see in the last days a denying of the power of God. B verse 6, For this sort are they which creep into houses... Now, I believe these to be churches. I believe these to be individual. Uh, these to be individual churches for this sort or type or they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers or various lusts. Now, there are going to be individuals that come into true churches and say, hey, I've got a better plan. Hey, I've got an idea that other people haven't thought of. I can fill this building from pew to pew and y'all will have to build on. You know what? That's captive, silly. Well, you know what has them captive? That, that word means prison. Sin. That's what has them captive. That's what's holding them. So when we begin to think about these extortioners taking something from us, this is the setup. This is how it begins. It begins long before things are beginning to be pulled and things are taken. It happens way, way before then. And we're not spiritually savvy enough to pick it up. Verse 7. Ever learning and never, come, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also... Resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Now, we see, we see two things, that, three things that the extortioner does. Number one, they have a corrupt mind. You know what that means? They're still lost. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they just don't. They have a corrupt mind. Secondly, we find that these individuals... Or reprobate concerning the truth. And I want you to say it says the truth. Not just truth like the truth of a, a fact. It, it means the word of God. It, it, mean, it means the full counsel. They're reprobate. They hate the truth. You know what? The longer I go in this. The more I see. How much real truth is hated. You want to fill this building up? Tell everybody they can come as you are. Pack it out. Once they get here, we'll put a dollar, twenty dollar bill right under here. And whoever sat on the pew with the twenty dollar bill gets it. You can pack it out. See, that, that was the type of Janice and Jambres. And they were there to steal things. That's an extortion. 
Now, we think of money immediately because of the confines of the flesh. But what they really stand still is your joy, your happiness, your gladness in the things of the Lord. That's what they steal from us. Now, we won't go there for time's sake, but in Acts chapter 5, you know, you know the story uh, of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, what they did, they didn't steal anything from the church necessarily. What they really stole from was their self. Number one, I think they were liars. I think that they did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not think they had been born again. I think they did not know of the common faith. I think they were strictly lost folks. And what they had was their own. But they lied and said, we'll give it all to the Lord. You know what? There's a lot of liars today that says that they're giving it all to the Lord. And I'm not talking about money. <laughs> I'm talking about time. I'm talking about effort. Strength. And all they are is liars. You know, uh, you know, in this, they're extortioners. They're, they're stealing things that belong to the Lord. That they're stealing things that belong to the church. You know what? If, if you're involved in one of the Lord's churches, you should give it a hundred and ten percent. And anything less is an extortioner. You're stealing from the church. And that is exactly what these people were. Go with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. Uh, Solomon, uh, the wisest man that ever lived, gives us some information concerning the spoiler. Now, we've all had things to spoil. Our milk was spoiling in about two days every week. Every time we bought a gallon of milk, within two days, uh, we, it, it'd be gone. I'm like, man, they're producing pitiful milk these days. Well, the problem wasn't the milk, it was our refrigerator was on one. And it needed to be on about four or five. Keep things cool. But the spoiler had arrived, right? And if we're not very cautious, the spoiler will not only arrive here, he'll arrive in you. Now, nine times out of ten, if the church is really on ball and focused, he won't come here because there's too many on the ball. But if you're not on the ball for yourself, he'll come to your house. He'll spoil you. He'll he, he'll do the he'll he'll do the trick where he has an opening. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter ten, the first verse. Uh, the Bible says, "Dead flies called the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor." Now, I want you to get this because an apothecary was a chemist, or uh, what we would think of as a druggist today, a pharmacist, and he made medicine for conditions sicknesses, illnesses in people, his responsibility was to get the right dose and the right compound together and give it to the individual. But we find here in this situation that flies had gotten in and destroyed the ointment. One of the ointment, you know, there was even ointments used in oils in the, in the Jewish sacrifice. They were to use those. But if they were perverse and perverted, that God would have no uh, would have, would have no delight in them. He would not be pleased. And, and so he says, dead flies cause the um, the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly with him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So we find that all it takes is a little bit. You know, we've all heard the old saying. Uh, one rotten apple will destroy the barrel. And we see that's how the spoiler works, just that much. We all talk about Alexander Campbell, the father of the Campbellites. Do you know he started out as a Baptist? And he got focused on one thing, and that was erroneous baptism. And it spoiled everything. It spoiled everything. In fact, to the point 
of one of the greatest heresy churches that ever came out. He came forth from there that there were there was a spoiler involved. So if you have in your life different so-called friends and individuals that, that make up your uh, the people that you spend time with, then you need to identify the spoilers. You know, uh, a spoiler is something that will ruin you if you give it time enough. A spoiler is something that will make you sick if, a, if enough time exposed to it will happen. That is a spoiler. Look with me in Isaiah 21, just a little over from where our text was. Isaiah 21. Uh, we see something else in the first verse. Isaiah 21, in the very first verse, the Bible says, The burden of the, of the des desert of the sea, the burden of the des desert of the sea, as uh, whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the, tr the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Median, all the sign thereof have I made to cease. Now, I want you to see that two things are we find here. Number one, the spoiler always spoils. He may look pleasant for a while. He may present himself as a good friend. You know, we, we sing a song, and you know, we sing so much, we really don't listen to what we sing. But one of those songs, we say, friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still I will enter in. You know, we don't look for our opposers to be friends, do we? But often they are. Now, I'll say this, they're not true blue, but you may have known them for 30 or 40 years. Friends may oppose me. And so we find here that the spoiler does come, but it takes time. It, it, it takes a uh, long exposure. It takes a while uh, of being exposed to, to this problem, and then it's often too late. The burden... Uh, a grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Then we find the remedy. Go up, O Elam, besiege. Now, here is the problem today, and I can be, I understand that I may be a little court sometime, and I am working on that. But I want you to see that the, the advice here when the problem was identified was besiege it. That means you go on the attack. Don't you wait for them. You go on the attack. And so if we see one of those issues in our life, if we see we're getting too connected to the world, what we need to do is besiege it. What we need to do is go out against it. If Facebook has come, become too big of a problem for you, and it's consuming the majority of the time, besiege it, get off of it, and be done with it. Attack them before it can attack you. See what I'm saying? We need to besiege the problem. If it's illness, if it's internet, if it, even if it's your job, besiege it. Take care of the problem because you know what? One day you'll wake up and you'll be consumed. It, it, it'll be done. It, 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 and you never really in, it, even identify the problem. That, that's what we as the Lord's people must understand and must know today that sometimes, the, the and we read it in the text, sometimes the enemy is covert. He, he's not obvious. He's not, he's not someone that you can pick up on as an enemy, but he is there. And the last thing that we found in our text that uh, attacks us on a daily basis is the oppressor or the oppressor. Uh, an oppressor comes, and it's very, very easy to understand that if you think about it. I use poor old Joey as an example. If I press right here, what's going to happen to Joey? He'll fall out and hit his head on the pew. And it just comes from pressing. It just comes from pushing. It just comes from shoving. 
day after day, week after week, just pressing, pressing, pressing. And you know what? If you're not studied up, if you're not in close relationship, you're in God, He will shove you down. He's good at it. He's gifted. He, he does that. And it can be a hundred of different, uh, a hundred different ways that He comes at you with this. But remember this, the oppressor always attacks. He's always present. He will always do that. And He's very, very excellent at what He does. Psalms uh, 54. Go with me there. Uh, Psalms 54. And uh, we'll read verse 3. I do want you to see this is a Psalm of David. Uh, a man that understood God better than we ever will. He says in Psalms uh, 54 verse 3. For strangers are risen up against me. And oppressors seek after my soul. They have not, they have not set God before them. Selah. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, be very wary of strangers. You know what? We should welcome anybody here to New Testament Baptist Church and, and, and enjoy their fellowship, but you beware of strangers. We want to get them to know them. You know what? I've learned from the last few weeks, it doesn't matter what people say they believe, you watch them for a while uh, because they are strangers. You need to know them. You need to understand who they are because, listen, strangers can get in and cause a great deal of problems, a great deal of difficulty, and we need to understand that uh, who they are, what they represent, what they cherish, what they hate, that is getting to know someone. And so he says, for strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors, oppressors, plural, more than one, seek after my soul. Now, was David a saved man? Sure he was. Could oppressors bring him down? Sure they could. Presented in a lot of different ways. Absalom. Bathsheba. And I think she gets a rack that wasn't her own. All Bathsheba was doing was doing what the law told her to do. What he was just saying for him and desiring to be with the woman. That, that, that was the problem. But see, his oppressor came... In many, many different ways, did it not? The Bible said even the devil came. Lucifer himself. And challenged him to number Israel. That's an oppressor. But that someone will bring you down to nothing. And the sad part is, most of the time... We don't even, we don't even pick up on what the oppressor does. You know what can be an oppressor to you... Watching TV till it makes you sick. You know what? I don't. I, I've never come to a point in my life. I really didn't know. I don't even know if I'm going to vote in November. I'm going to be real honest with you. Uh, you know what? Everybody says voting uh, uh, for the lesser of two evils. I don't know that that exists. Do you? And, and I, I really, I really don't know. I thought about just doing a writing and say Larry Lafferty because I think I could fix things up down there. But the old press comes. You know what? If, if news is being an issue to you, shut it off. Right? I mean, that, that'll take a rocket scientist. If you're down and out and you're not sure what the next step will be, get on your knees before God and pray and pray and pray and pray. You know, the worst thing you can do is just muddle in something. You know what? We have to deal with problems in this life. Certainly that's true. But they do not have to consume you. Get up and do something. Get your mind on something else. You know what? Mama told me this when I was a little boy, and I found it very much to be true. Larry, there's always somebody in worse shape than you. 
Anybody else ever get that advice from their parents? Sure. And, and so what I have found, I can get the mother grubs, or maybe, just maybe, I can find that individual that's in worse shape than me and go to them and be a blessing and be an encouragement to them because, you know what? They're worse off than me. You know what? If you're down to two pieces of bread, there may be someone that don't have any. You take one of yours and give it to them, and then you both have a piece. Right? The oppressor uh, comes in many, 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 many ways because he's a prince at it. Proverbs chapter 3, just a little, a little further over. Proverbs 3, in verse 31. The Bible says, Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. Now, let me say this concerning this oppressor. And, and I'll give you an example in my own life because I don't like to talk about other people. But, you know, one of my oppressors, and I've told you this before, was a so-called friend of mine named Greg Ray. Now, I'm not trashing him. I'm just telling you a story. If he listens to this broadcast, Greg, I hope it will be encouragement to you. That's all I can say. But you know what? He had all the hallmarks if I had been spiritual enough to see them for what they were then. If I had been able to pick up on it and, and have an understanding. Notice what the Bible says. Envy thou not the oppressors. Envy will mess you up. Now I'll tell you my story with my friend. At 14 years old, his mama and daddy bought him a 68 Corvette Stingray, red hardtop convertible. It was gorgeous. I mean, and I've been going, I went down El Carver Stretch with 150 in it. It would move. But you know what? That wasn't my car and that wasn't my business. But I knew he did. You know what? I thought, I make better grades than he does. I'm more responsible than he is. And he's got to that. I was envious. Who really was? I, I, I wanted it. But you know what? He had a lot of other problems too. And I didn't see those. Why? Because I was focused on what I had envy about. Envy not thou the oppressor. And choose none of his ways. And we do that too. And you know what I've found? You know how I got to do the Corvette and drive it at 150 miles across El Carver Stretch? I hung out with him. And he eventually trusted me enough to drive that bad. But you know, there was, there was a lot of compromises along the way. And that's what, that's what Solomon, and you know what? Follow the life of Solomon, he did the same thing. Wisest man that ever lived if he did the same thing. So the oppressors are not necessarily going to be mean people. They may present themselves as friends. Be very cautious because the oppressors come. So we think, see this advice that he gave to everyone. Last place, again, I want you to see it's in Ecclesiastes, the other book written uh, by Solomon. And he, he understood this very well. But I'll have to say this concerning Solomon. He understood it far too late. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, chapter 4 verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions, plural, that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such, <laughs> the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. Now, you know what? First of all, I'll give you this to consider. Consider who your oppressors are. You better know them. You better understand who they are. Because you can't see them if you don't know them. Does that make sense? You, you can't understand them. You don't know what they're doing if you don't know who they are. And then I want you to see 
that there's more than one. They said the oppressor. So it may be the TV. It may be the radio. It may be the internet. It may be your job. It could be a multitude of oppressors. And it usually is. And I want you to see that it says, And those that were oppressed, they were taken away, they were consumed by it. They had no comforter. You know what? Blessed be the name of the Lord this morning. We have a comforter. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. We should thrill in it. We should glorify Him. Because we do not have to be taken down. He is stronger than they are. We are not stronger, but He is strong. We do not have to live in the mud. We do not have to continue in the filth of this world. We do not have to lay down and give up because our God is stronger. Amen. And we ought to thrill in that. In this day, they had no comforter. And I personally believe it's because the Lord Jesus Christ had not arrived yet. I'll even go further than this. I think the Holy Ghost was in glory as well. Because if you follow down through accepting creation, every time the Lord made a message known, He sent an angel. And He stopped doing that in the early part of the New Testament. And the reason why, I think, is that He sent the Holy Ghost. And so we find in this that we do have a comforter if we're down to the end of nothing, we have prayer and we have the Holy Spirit and we have the Word of God that is far better than what Israel had at this time. Then notice, and on, and on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. You know what? There is great power out there today. It, it, you know what? It would scare us to death if we could see the evilness that even dwells in Stewart County. If we could see the fakes for what they are. If we could see the charlatans for who they are. It would scare us to death. But there's a comforter out there. No, we really